according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to the Lord. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money in deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags, for whoever he has will more be given, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. My text today is the Gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 25. If you were here uh, last week, you heard me talk about how chapter 25 of Matthew continues the lengthy discourse that started in chapter 24, all related to the second coming of Christ and the time between now and then. Um, our passages for these last three weeks of the church year all have to do with the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ, the end of time, the closeout of all of history. And so chapter 25 in Matthew has three parables in it, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, the parable of the sheep, and the goats. All three parables have to do with the end of time and the second coming of Christ. So you heard me tell you last week in the parable of the ten virgins that there were five wise and five foolish. The foolish virgins missed the coming of the bridegroom who was delayed at midnight because they didn't have enough oil in their lamps. And you also heard me tell you that oftentimes that parable is preached as though the main focus is you need to make sure you have enough oil. In other words, be prepared. Have, have what you're supposed to have to be prepared for the late arrival of the bridegroom. And of course, the problem with understanding the parable that way is then you have to ask, well, what is the oil? <clears throat> And so I propose that a far better way to understand that parable is that although it may secondarily be saying, be prepared, that's what it takes to be prepared, more importantly, it's telling you, expect to wait. That the coming of Christ could happen at any time, but you also have to expect to wait. Be prepared that you may have to wait for the second coming of Christ. Now, you know a little something about waiting, don't you? I wish I could think of one occasion to make this more vivid, but I just couldn't. There were so many that came into my mind where I was called to go to the hospital for somebody that was near the end. So they're all plugged into machines, oftentimes not conscious. You step into the room, it's hushed and quiet. 
except for the beeping of all the machines. Outside in the waiting room is the family waiting, waiting. We have to wait sometimes for our suffering to end. We have to wait for our vindication at the end of time. Romans chapter 8 tells us that all creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, the final day when God's children are going to be put in their rightful place. We wait for our eternal reward. But how do you wait? Having been in many of those waiting rooms in hospitals, I've seen people wait in different ways. Some that manage it well, some that manage it less well. How do we wait for the coming of the Lord? You know, if we expected Christ to come back tomorrow, we would wait a little differently, wouldn't we? Aren't you glad we had, Gary knew somebody that did the parking lot uh, cracks. Did you notice that when you pulled in, all the parking lot cracks have been filled, and if the weather warms up enough, they'll get it re-striped for us. But if Christ was going to come back tomorrow, we wouldn't worry about filling the cracks, because we don't care if it freezes this winter, do we? <laughs> or... Where, uh, you maybe have noticed that the church talked about having an endowment fund, and at the next voters meeting in January, there will probably be more discussion about an endowment fund. It's actually in our Constitution that we're supposed to do it, we just never have done it. So that you, when your time to depart from this life comes, you have the great opportunity to give one last witness to Jesus Christ as your Savior by making sure that your will puts something toward the work of the kingdom and giving it to the endowment fund. Isn't that a great thing? But if Christ was coming back tomorrow, we wouldn't worry about the endowment fund, would we? We have to expect, because Christ told us to, that we may be waiting for a little while for him to come. And that means we conduct our affairs a little differently. We plan it out and we expect that this might take some time and we have to be prepared. And so the next two parables in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats, build on this theme that we have to win it. And it tells us more about how we should wait. What should be our conduct during this time between now and when Christ returns, how do we wait for him? Oh, oh to be sure, these two parables are, are, are on the same track as the parable of the ten virgins, reminding us that we have to wait. In verse 19 of our text today, the master who went away it tells us that after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. You hear that? That it might be a long time. Or the parallel passage of this story, which is in Luke chapter 19. Instead of talking about the five talents and the two talents and the one talent, it's the, the ten minus and the five minus and the one minus. But in other words, it's very similar. Probably came from a similar occasion in which Jesus told the story. You always have to be careful when you're interpreting scripture about transferring things from one parallel text to another. But it is instructive to note that that passage in Luke chapter 19 says that the whole reason Jesus told them the parable was because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So he told the parable to let them know, no, this could be a while yet. Oh yes, we are going to have to wait. But these parables are not just merely repeating the idea that we have to wait. They're building and they're instructing us as to how we should wait, what this period, this waiting period is supposed to look like. Now let's take a look for a few moments at this parable of the talents. The master is gone. What does the time when the master is gone and we're awaiting his return, what does that time look like? Now, I argued last week that there might be a secondary sense in the parable of the ten virgins that we have to be prepared, have enough oil. And so there might be a secondary sense in this parable, too, where to please our master when he returns, one of the things we should do while we're waiting is invest our talents. Sure, of course we should do that. So if you have a talent for music, 
Why aren't you up here singing in the choir? Why not? I have some paperwork that needs to be done. I got a little project. So if you've got a computer and you've got some time on your hands, come and see me. I got a little project for you. Why not? If you're strong and healthy, why this winter will there be the 75 year olds and the 65 year olds out there shoveling snow? Come on, come and shovel some snow. Why not? But the problem with making that the main point of this parable is the same problem we had with the parable of the ten virgins. If the problem with that parable was to have enough oil, you had to ask, well, what's the oil? And if this, this parable is to invest your talents, you have to ask, well, what are the talents? What is he talking about? Our English word talent does derive from the Greek word that is used here. But our English word for talents means something rather different than what the original meant. So is it saying use your natural talents, that you're a good bookkeeper, or you're strong and you can shovel, or you're good at music? Is it talking about your spiritual gifts or your spiritual talents? Another commentator said it's the law. Another one said it's using the opportunities that God gives you. A good Lutheran one said it's the word of God and the sacraments. And of course, a very common one for people is to say that because he's talking in this parable about money, that it's talking about your money. The problem is, as soon as we begin to say the talents refer to this, or to that, we start limiting the scope of the parable. I think the much larger focus, the thing that we should see in this parable, is that it's a powerful reminder that God is our master. We are the servants. In fact, the word that's translated here as uh, servants is very literally the slaves. We are God's slaves. And that means that all of our lives and all that we have and all that we can do, they don't belong to us. We are stewards. We're responsible for handling these things, not for our own benefit, but for him and for his benefit. Any Lord of the Ring fans in here? Any place? A couple? So do you remember Lord Denethor, the steward of Gondor? He acted like the king, but he was not the king. He was the steward. He was responsible to take care of the kingdom until the king returned. And hence the third book of the series, The Return of the King. So the slave who buried his talent is the slave who showed no concern or interest in the master's concerns, in the well-being of the master's goods. And there are people who live today as though they will not be accountable to God for what God has given them. Now I'll tell you, when I talk to people like that, face to face, one on one, pastorally, I have to, I have to meet them where they are, right? I have to walk out in the minefield and kind of step to where they are in life and slowly and gently escort them. It doesn't do any good for me to holler at people in the minefield and say, you're going to get blown up out there. <laughs> but when I'm speaking from the pulpit, I need to lay out the landscape the way it is. The master in the parable gave to each one of the servants according to their ability. Each one was given what they were given according to their ability to manage it on behalf of the master. So if you can't manage what you have for the Lord, maybe the Lord should give you a little less. Talk to somebody who said, I work so hard Monday through Saturday, and Sunday's my only day to rest. It's so hard for me to get to church because it's the only time I have for myself. Well, maybe if you've got so much work to do, and you have so much responsibility, Maybe the Lord should take a little away from you. Someone said, I can't afford to give more to the offering for the work of the Lord. And maybe their life is too large. The Lord needs to scale it back a little bit. Or Sunday's my only day for the family. Well, maybe the Lord 
wants to take some family away. Let that sink in for a second. Do you feel the terror of the law? The rumbling, distant thunder of God's demands. Whatever excuse you come up with, no matter how good that excuse is, he gave you what you have according to your ability to use it for him. If you're not using it for him, maybe he will take it away and give it to someone who has so that they will have an abundance. The fact is, brothers and sisters, he is God and you are the slave. Everything you have and are and do is for his concerns, not for yours. Oh, some people don't like to hear a message like that. We hear, I hear that according to polls, we have more atheists in America than we've ever had before. But of course, the scripture says that everybody deep down inside knows that there is a God. And so people don't choose to be atheists because they're convinced by the logic of the arguments. They choose to be atheists because they don't like the truth, because another belief is more pleasant than the demands of the law. Or perhaps they just ignore it altogether. But there's no way to get away from it. There will be an accounting when Jesus comes back on the last day. But let me take this another step. The third slave, the one who buried his talent, he was in trouble because of what he did, or really because of what he didn't do, because he didn't invest it for the Lord. But do you know what his real problem was? His real problem was what he believed. You see, everyone believes something, and you act according to what you believe. If your belief is wrong, then your actions will be. So we hear in the parable how when the master returned, that third servant said to him, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. What was his problem with the master? The master was a hard man. The master reaped where he did not sow and gathered where he had not scattered. In other words, in the minds of that third slave, God was not fair. <clears throat> How many people struggle with that? God is not fair. It's a huge problem for people. I've talked to so many people through the years that if you can cut through all the muck and get down into what they really believe, many people will say, God didn't do right by me. It wasn't right that God had me be born in this family. It wasn't right that God gave that person this and only gave me that. It wasn't right what God let so-and-so do to me. It wasn't right what God had happened in my life. God isn't fair. In fact, we read about this third servant. Jesus goes beyond the... the parameters of a story and says that this third servant is cast out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is Jesus' favorite expression for hell. And think about what that is. Gnashing of teeth. Hell will be filled not with people going, oh God, give me another chance. If only I could do it again, I would serve you this time. No, hell will be feet filled with people going, God wasn't fair. I don't like what God did to me. I hate God. And even suffering in hell, they will be rebellious against their master. Well, I'll save my talk about the justice of God for another occasion. But I want to call to your attention what the master said back to this third slave. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. Well, then you should have put my money in deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. See, if we really follow the implications of our feelings that sometimes God isn't fair to us, then we should work even harder to please him because we know that he's hard, master. No, the real problem is that we are wicked. 
And so in the very first sense, it wasn't what this slave did or failed to do that got him in trouble. It was his distorted beliefs that got him into trouble. By contrast then, the first two slaves, the ones who pleased their master, did so because they understood that God owns all things, that we are his stewards, that we are here to bring him honor. They, their beliefs were the right, were in the right. You see, we are either slaves to sin or we are slaves to God. In John, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. When you understand that God, the master, the one with the unyielding law that you must serve him or else, that he also loves you. That he also sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. That in your baptism, he identified you as, your, as his own. And through the preaching of the word and the scriptures, he keeps calling out to you, saying, I love you. I love you. You are chosen. You are precious. You are mine. As you come to understand that, your belief changes. And instead of shaking your fist at God and saying, you're not fair, you start to say, all that I have, Lord, belongs to you. Let me give it to you. Let me live for you. Amen. Now, in place of the confession of the creed, which we would normally do at this point, I'd like to ask if you would stand, and we're going to read the second article of the creed, along with the meaning of the second article, according to Luther's small catechism. In the second article, we confess the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who takes away our sin and rescues us from the snares of the devil. We confess. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, who through God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also the true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with silver or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him and his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, and lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. 